to the kill count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm Zoran, my mom says I kinda look like Leonardo DiCaprio, Gavoyich. And today, we go from the country to the city with Critters 3, released direct-to-video in 1991. With the box office flop of part two, New Line wasn't interested in more Critters. They only changed their mind when producer Barry Opper suggested filming Critters 3 and 4 back to back, on the same budget as the first movie. Two for the price of one. New Line agreed, giving us two subpar Critters sequels, but teaching associate producer Mark Ordesky a valuable lesson. He and the studio would use the same back to back filming technique for a little franchise called Lord of the Rings. By Spending low budget, it was a great experiment for them because they learned how to do it on a large level. Directing duties fell to Christine Peterson, who was the first assistant director on Kill Counted films such as Nightmare on Elm Street 5 and Chopping Mall. Oh, and some movie called Tremors? Bixby! Oh, actually, we're not doing Tremors. All right, fine, go ahead. Bixby! The film was shot by Tom Calloway, who also shot Slumber Party Massacre 2, as well as so many direct-to-video sequels that I never knew existed. My god, another SLC punk. That, that was not a thing. While Critters 2 was a fun, sometimes gory, practical, effects-filled ride, Critters 3, much like the later Tremors films, suffers from its tight budget, shortened shooting schedule, and singular location, meaning it can get pretty boring. Though the Krite effects are still top-notch thanks to the returning Kyoto Brothers. We had all the, all the tools, but I guess at the end of the day, maybe we didn't have the time. Critters 3 is famously Leonardo DiCaprio's first movie, which is not something he's proud of. He said that he didn't want to talk about that movie. It was terrible, so I guess he sort of wants to erase it from his memory. Damn, iceberg cold of you, Leo, considering you actually love the Critters on set. He, he was a young kid. He thought they were cool, so he was... <laughs> really into working with them. Along with DiCaprio, we have a returning Don Opper as the lovable, good-natured Charlie, as well as a cast of character actors doing what they can with the script they got. They play a bunch of residents of a low-income apartment building being terrorized by Kreitz. You know, when they're not busy with gremlins' levels of mischief. Not gremlins. Can the new high-rise setting cause our death toll to rise even higher? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins with a screaming tumbleweed of a TITLE CARD! <laughs> we meet the Sawyer family, possibly a nod to the family from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, since writer David Scow also wrote the third entry in that franchise. These less cannibally Sawyers include Father Clifford, Daughter Annie, and Little Bowl Cut Johnny. That's how I looked as a kid. They're on their way home from a family vacation when a tire blowout forces them to pull over at a rest stop. While Dad plays Pep Boys, Annie very carefully opens a soda and sees her bro being harassed by a center-parted future heartthrob. Hey you! Hands off! Yeah, he belongs to me, hands off! Leonardo DiCaprio plays Josh Briggs, a pissed off prepubescent who loses Johnny's frisbee and, you know, makes a little shitbird face. His gang of new dorks is terrified to descend this mild incline, mainly because of what Josh said earlier. It could be badgers or something down there. Badgers? Badgers? We don't need no stinking badgers! We need critters! Josh heads down to find both the frisbee and this franchise's most reoccurring character. <laughs> Charlie's literal launch back into the franchise scares the kids, as well it should. Why are you hiding in a spring-loaded hole, you big, big freak? He further scares them with a recap of the first two films. In 1984, I was riding my bicycle. Sure, he gets the year wrong. Critters was 1986, as this very movie mentions a bit later. Rover's Bend, 1986. But to be fair, back then he was drunker than Rick Dalton in a pool, and his memory's probably a bit hazy. Wilbur Finletter then tells the kids to get out of here, but not before he gives Johnny a critter alert crystal. This ever starts to glow bright green. That's a time to watch out for yourself. Too bad his dad doesn't have one to warn him of this critter that just walks through the open field and kinda hitches a ride, Sideshow Bob style. The Sawyers and this clutch of critters eggs, that I guess it just carried across that field, end up hitting the road, driving past a more budget-friendly Grover's Bend. What a crock. You know what else is a crock? The entire internet saying that this movie takes place in Los Angeles. And though it was filmed there, a throwaway line places the Sawyer home in Topeka, Kansas. Come on, it's so obvious. I mean, who would drive such a ridiculous length to get into a Critters movie? Nice to meet you, Mr. Brown. Oh, hi, Billy Zane. 
Their home is this apartment building, where a guy named Mario is moving out. Unfortunately for him, the brakeless smoking Sawyer machine crashes into Mario's moving truck like a blue shell. I'm sorry, Mario, no brakes. Uh, something I can do? Oh, just to tell a peach I'm gonna be late for dinner. Woohoo! Oh, actually, let me do that again as uh, Chris Pratt Mario. I'm sorry, tell Peach that I'll be late for dinner. Wahoo! Nailed it! I kid, his performance was fine. Mario's being escorted out of this party by Frank Longo, a handyman who dresses like the lead singer of a Han Solo ska band. He's played by Jeffrey Blake, who is having a lot of fun with this role. You can take that to the bank! Bulls. What Jeffrey's performance is based on, I don't know, but I'm so glad for what he brought to <laughs> Actually, I think he's just doing his character of Ralph from Fern Gully. You, you think the leveler can handle this baby? Sure, the leveler eats everything. Kind of like you. Borrowing some plot from Batteries Not Included, this man Frank is more hench than handy. He's been hired by the building's landlord to make conditions so miserable people are forced to move out. Whether that means fake breaking the elevator or just straight up sexually harassing them. I got a little phone problem. Maybe you could come down to the basement and check out my equipment. After enough people leave, the landlord can pave this apartment paradise and put up a mini mall. The most evil real estate development of the 1980s. I know this takes place in the 90s. Close enough. Frank's almost reached his ousting quota. He's just gotta dislodge a few more residents. Perhaps Rosalie, the 1950s cartoon housewife without the rolling pin. Or Marsha, the phone company woman who's either an ineffectual love interest for Cliff or a mildly coded lesbian character. There's also the elderly couple, Mr. and Mrs. Menges, who occasionally babysit Annie and Johnny. Mr. Menges is an alien conspiracist who, whoa, hey alien, huh, I respect the no pants, but maybe put the mouse back in the house. His wife is played by the late Frances Bay, who has a happy place in all our hearts as Happy Gilmore's grandma. Frankie's job is made even harder when a couple of new crypt tenants move into the basement. And I want to point out, this entire apartment building interior was built in a Los Angeles grocery store that was previously used for the Hulk Hogan film Suburban Commando, which, you know, has this amazing moment. Of course, not being on a real soundstage caused some issues. There was a light too close to a sprinkler head. So in the middle of our shooting, the sprinkler system goes off. It was a difficult shoot, but the cast and crew still banded together. He even had a weekly Critters newsletter that included fun relationship news and facts about the crew. It was a little society for that period of time that was very sad to let go of. Though it wasn't evident in earlier scenes, Papa Cliff is kind of a crappy dad. He hasn't been the same since his wife died a couple years ago, presumably at the hands of this mutant killer snowman. Now his only loves are TV and dad jokes. But what was I like then? Shorter. Annie's got the blues, but her dad misses her clues to hang out when the TV short circuits. Maybe I could go get Johnny and we could play a game or something. Give me your battery power TV, would you? Yep, that's how you dad. In the basement, knockoff Jason Mewes is being pervy. But before he can discover what secret Victoria is hiding, he's distracted by a dryer noise. Oh, come on, man. Don't be a Jay Brown and reach in there with your hand. Ow, ow, ow. Hot, hot. <laughs> Damn, teenagers. Yeah, those teenagers always heating up shoes in the dryer. Frank then falls victim to the classic critter prank of launching out of the shadows. He manages to fight it off with a couple of screwy stabs, but another is waiting to go for a gut brunch, knocking him to the ground. The sleaze bag is then ultimately eaten off screen by a bunch of... I get that last one-liner in there. But the danger is far from over, according to Jonathan's Critter Alert Crystal. Has this ever happened to you? There has to be a better way. There is. You need a CAC. Excuse me? CAC, the Critter Alert Crystal. Oh, I thought you said cock. <laughs> no, the CAC is a patented alien plot device that'll glow green whenever a crite is in the vicinity. All you gotta do is firmly grip the CAC in your hand and let it do all the work. It's so easy, even a child could use it. Oh, I don't think that's right. So say goodbye to surprising balls with CAC. Ask your local Charlie in a jump scare hole if CAC is right for you. In his freshly eaten condition, Frank can't answer a phone call from the evil landlord, who's revealed to be none other than Josh's stepfather, Mr. Briggs. Ooh, what a Shutter Island level twist! This guy was introduced earlier in what must be the most coincidental scene ever. He just happened to run into his tenants at a rest stop who don't even know who he is. Well, at least they did a good job of making him look evil, drinking Boone's Farm like it's a 30-year-old Macallan. Yes, with an umbrella in it. Whew. 
I don't know how you drink your scotch. Well, that's overpriced. Briggs needs to finish what Frank started at his building and get rid of the rest of the tenants. Josh looks up from his game of Calvin Candy Crush and desperately tries to get out of this movie. Can't you just drop me off at home? No way, sport. Yeah, we need to slap you on the box art so we can sell this crap. Rosalie goes to check on Frank only to find one of Miss Piggy's bras. Oh, Kermy. Ah, uh, that's gross. Sorry, Piggy. She also finds a sentient dryer lint ball that freaks out from its species shared Easter trauma. So it cat buries a quill in this Kyer Banner guard. Rosalie drops a bottle of bleach as she runs away, causing the origin of our phantom critter of the green bra. The critters this time around were more advanced, employing a telemetry system in the arms to give them more movement. Unfortunately, this added more servos and weight, which led to other issues. There were puppeteers actually getting like yeah, nerve like, 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 pains and damage. Yeah, it's just really painful from, from the stuff. Also, with a smaller critter cast than the last movie, they decided to make each crate more unique, like Bleach here. He's basically our stripe for this movie. Not gremlins. Another critter scares Rosalie into a clothesline that wraps her up, and then she fends them off in the most casual way ever, just kinda pushing some boxes. Yeah, that'll do it. She's found by Annie, who frees her, and then literally mops the floor with one of them for a very long time. <laughs> they get upstairs and forfeit this round of Don't Wake Daddy to let Cliff know what's going on. Wait, they're like rats! Rats! No, no, no! What happened? No badgers! Badgers! Mushroom! Mushroom! The critters arrive and use their badger bullets that aren't quite as effective as the last movie. Annie continues this franchise's obsession with bowling in a fun scene where she bowls a trash can and it's intercut with clips of Michelle Mullen, an accomplished woman's bowling champion turned Olympic bowling coach. Annie gets a perfect strike that ends with some graduation critters. My BFA in fine arts will be useful! Woo! In the basement, Briggs and Mop Top can't find Frank, so Briggs decides to go full Snake Plissken and cut the power to the world of this apartment complex. The movie gives up on filming things for a bit until Marsha returns looking like Juno in The Descent. She rescues the other tenants and cozies up to Cliff, who treats her like she's one of his kids. Who are you? Marsha, you know me, Cliff. I'll just chalk that up to the quill ludes he's on right now. Mr. Briggs continues his search for non-David tenants in the weirdest way possible. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Your landlord is here to evict you. Oh, well, if you're gonna evict it, ah, almost got me. Man, this movie isn't even subtle about him being an evil landlord trope. These people are animals, and pretty soon you can't tell them apart. The people, the pets, they've all got fleas. He makes his way to the old Sawyer place where Bubba, Drayton, and Nubbins are watching Julia Child on the TV. Leo, however, would rather be at the beach and once again tries to leave the movie. Give me the keys, I'm gonna wait in the car. He's denied because Mr. Briggs thinks he's a growing pain in the ass. And in return, Josh inadvertently sentences his stepdad to death. I hate you. I wish you were dead! Careful what you wish for. Ooh, yeah, you know what? After that, I should sentence you to murder. But for you, Leo, I'll make an inception. Oh, it, exception. I <laughs> said it wrong. The critters attack Briggs while Leonardo throws himself on the door, like he should have done in Titanic. Everything goes quiet, and we finally see what's eating Arnie Grape's dad when Marcia shows up to spin him right round onto the count. Save the limo! Marcia and Josh head upstairs when a critter appears. Ooh, ooh, that's the thing to kill my stepdad! Marcia shoves her flare into its mouth, which scared the crap out of puppeteer Edward Kyoto. When she was supposed to make the move toward it, but stop short. But in the, when the cameras are rolling, boom, a live flare, and I'm looking at it in a monitor. And <laughs> <laughs> the critter has some comedic heartburn before falling down the laundry chute. And we can add one deep fried prairie oyster to the bouncy board. The tenants all regroup in the Menji's apartment where we get an emotional reunion between Annie and Josh. Josh, Annie. Oh, that's it? <laughs> Hilarious. They block the door while Cliff and Rosie sleep off the quaaludes they probably got from Joshy Belfort. The critters then start their assault on apartment 13, so the folks inside grab things to arm themselves with. How about a big knife? How about a meat cleaver, dear? God damn, that's amazing. And it'll be able to slice up those marble rides. Annie and Josh find an attic that should take them to the roof, but they'll need to get Cheech and Chong here to climb a ladder first. No ladder. 
I'll go up a ladder tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Annie, how about a little motivation here? Move your ass now! A too long comedic ladder climbing scene finishes with the critters somehow in the cabinets. What are they, Nightcrawler? Can they teleport? Why bother with the door? Well, it doesn't matter, because Marsha's the last one up and easily defends herself with some 10th Doctor kicks before barricading the attic door behind them. The now standard Kyoto Critters Comedy Hour begins with a riff that sounds way too close to Gremlins. We've got pies, bubbles, and beans that turn into... All the fifth grade humor you could want in this very messy scene that, like the last film, did not make the Kyotos happy. When the puppets came back to the shop that night, they were destroyed. We had a low inventory of puppets, a very tight plan of how those puppets needed to last for two movies. We have to work all night now to get them ready. Maybe we'll have them there by noon. And to add insult to injury, Bing Crittersby here makes it a white Christmas by tossing flour everywhere. Which was another big problem since all that dust in the air is how silo explosions happen. And as soon as he said it, poof, the whole place exploded with a big flash. And then, so not only did we have puppets that had were filled with food, they were singed. Speaking of fires, that dead critter from before has just Jerry Lee Lewis the basement. And with a partially locked roof hatch, the tenants are losing hope, prompting another emotional scene when Annie tries to comfort Josh about the death of his snidely stepdad. My mom died. Not like your dad. Oh really? She wasn't eaten by a group of space badgers. Fuck off. They need a way out, so Marsha, 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 the phone company worker, climbs on her one character trait. She gets distracted when Josh and Annie don't look up and instead see a fire down below, prompting her to fall to her almost death. A chuckle-worthy scene commences as she can't quite swing her way to Bill and Ted's favorite mode of transport. Meanwhile, Annie goes to the elevator to conquer her fear of heights. We never established she was afraid of heights. Yeah, who cares? This whole thing's a mess. She very easily does and gets downstairs to find a critter freaking the hell out. <laughs> The Spiorg note alerts the others, and we get our first critter given name. <laughs> oh, oh no, I, I don't think we can say that. The critters roll to the rescue while Annie blocks Quills with the out of order sign. Oh, Frank, you even write the way you talk. I love you. The other critters arrive, including this cool one with tiger stripes that I'm pretty sure we'll never see again. They aren't the only new arrivals, though, since prepubescent Tarzan's here, too. <laughs> A door explosion adds another crate to the count with goopy flair. And a second is shot by Charlie before his pinto bean gun, ironically, runs out of gas. Come on, Charlie, don't you remember the old rhyme? Beans, beans, the musical fruit. The more you make super destructive alien weapons out of them, the less they shoot. They escape into the elevator, joining up with everyone, including Rosalie, who is very happy to see Charlie. Who is that hunk that just came in with your daughter? That's exactly how I feel when I see a Graboid. Zoran, please don't have sex with that Graboid. <laughs> have sex with a Graboid? Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> Charlie's here looking for some crites and a clean pair of shorts, thanks to an earlier phone call from Mr. Menjis. Actually, what did he call Charlie on? Because I did not see a phone in his scary kid hidey hole. But hey, ignore that plot hole. Look, bubbles! Yay, pretty! Or pretty deadly, since it heralds the critter's arrival. Where the hell was your crystal, kid? Charlie stares one down as it leaps around like Yoda fighting Dooku, while the Menjis trap another quill keeper in a quilt. This allows Josh to lay down a great smacks bee and turn this furry basketball into diarrhea. Josh is tranked by this fantastic fursome, and Aunt Barbara don't stand for that shit. So she uses her meat cleaver to decapitate the lone quillman. Uh, Grandma? I think you killed that Mr. Mr. Critter. Mr. Mr. Charlie is still staring down the last crite while the kids try and fix his mean bean machine gun. Their tiny kid fingers do the trick and Charlie shoots the critter out the roof, where it explodes not once, but twice for some reason. It leaves only a flaming eye and an arm behind to scare Marsha, who was finally able to call the cops from the phone booth. Everyone makes it up to the roof and calls for help, but I guess this city is a ghost town? I mean, I don't know anyone who lives in Topeka, do you? So, you know, good luck. And speaking of luck, the critter alert crystal starts glowing greener than a little shit shoe buckle hat, which means the bleach critter that Josh Tommy Jarvis earlier survived. Yay, cause he was expensive. 
It makes its way up to the roof and sets its sights on Jonathan, then revs up like a sonic spinball. Gotta go fast! With no makeshift tinfoil lasers to protect him, it's up to Charlie to take the furry bullet with a less Tarzan-y scream. <laughs> the kid still gets knocked off like Jack Slater's son, but he's saved by Annie who says, Johnny, grab my hand, I will catch you! But both kids are ultimately saved by Daddy, who's finally decided to be an actual guardian to his kids. Charlie is still alive since he ain't no flagpole quitter, but eventually he just gives us a very goofy scream. <laughs> and lands on the roof of the RV. When he gets up, we see that the bleach critter was impaled on the RV's antenna like a little Mark Watney on Mars. Brrrr! That was him, not me. The authorities arrive, and the next morning, Annie and Josh continue their emotional relationship. How about getting together sometime and doing something normal? <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, they are not. Josh's mom tells the tenants they can have her late husband's money, so everything's all set for them. Oh, and Cliff's probably gonna try and get with Terry from Motel Hell now, so that's nice. Just beware of her ex. <coughs> Much to Rosalie's disappointment, Charlie has left them to look for more crites. If only these damn credits would stop slowing him down. He eventually finds two more artichoke eggs, but before he can destroy them, a cameo alarm goes off. It's Terrence Mann as Ugg, in hologram form. They did this effect with a laser and another beam splitter, and actually used a projector and live Terrence Mann on set to achieve the effect in camera, sweetening it with one less technological technique. And we had a couple of guys underneath it, I think they were grips, and they would just take puffs of cigarettes and blow the smoke out, and it would just create around the lens, which was pretty amazing looking. The impressive ingenuity even fooled New Line when they watched the raw footage. And, uh, Rupert told me that they had sent in the dailies and New Line came back wanting to know why they were already spending money on doing opticals when they haven't even cut the movie. Opticals being an old name for effect shots. Ugg tells Charlie that those are the last two Krite eggs in the universe and he's prohibited from turning them into omelets. Instead, he needs to put them into a specimen collection pod sent by the Intergalactic Council, which promptly arrives along with a to-be-continued card that ends the movie. How many tenants were evicted from their lives by these slumlords from outer space? Let's find out and get to the numbers. James? W what are you doing here? You're supposed to be on your honeymoon. Affirmative. Chelsea and I are still enjoying our trip, but I needed to show up to make sure that people keep watching these critters kill counts. You know that as a series goes on, the views go down. Yeah, but what are you gonna do to keep the views up? Give the people what they want. Which is why I've sent another host to take over for the next kill count. Whoa, what? Who? They're inside this pod. What pod? Uh -huh. well, that's pretty exciting for next week. I still gotta do the numbers, though. Do, 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 freeze frame jokes. Only two people died in Critters 3, both men, okay. giving us a chart as blue as Leonardo DiCaprio's eye. Oh, sorry, uh, with a runtime of 94 minutes, that gives us a kill on average every 47 minutes. As for the bounty board, we can add six critters, three for the tenants and three for Charlie and his Ford Pinto gun, giving us a critter kill on average every 15.7 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Frank Longo. It's actually got some fun extended puppet acting. And honestly, this guy reminded me of Chandler's roommate Eddie from Friends, and I hated that guy. See you later, pally. Dull machete for lamest kill goes to Mr. Briggs by default. Also doesn't help that his body was just kind of turned around in a chair like he were a Bond villain. And the Bounty Booty Award for best critter kill goes to Bubbles. I honestly love the comically large meat cleaver, the Bubbles, and getting to see Evelyn Metcalf cut a critter in half. And that's it. Critters 3 came out in 1991, and I remember liking it more as a kid than I did today. Definitely a victim of budget, but hey, at least there was a ton of Critter Mayhem, which is more than can be said for the sequel that I'll be looking at next week. But until then, I'm a man who refuses to use sniper rifles in Fortnite, and this has been The Kill Count. There you go, Critters 3 done. That's the halfway point in our franchise here, and I... I'm so warm in this outfit right now, I should not have done this, but hey, happy accident. There is a flannel lining in here, so technically still wearing a flannel. I want to take a moment this time and thank Elite Replica Productions, who did my critter puppet, this bleach critter, these critter eggs, the Easter eggs from before. Please check them out on Etsy. Just, they're so 
good. They're so good. If you want critter stuff, that's the place to try and go. Honestly, I mean, I had not watched Critters since I was a kid and you know, it's entertaining enough to see Leo in his first movie. And again, Critters effects, so good that I love the Kyotos. They do such a good job. What do I have to thank? Uh, I don't really know because I am so hot in this jacket right now that I'm just gonna do this for a minute and uh, take it off and say until next week, be good people. <laughs> Wee!